Good evening, everybody. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from Nikki and Ann from Table to Table to kind of share just a little bit about their program and what they do. So give it up for Nikki and Ann. Hi, good evening. Thanks for having us today. Um, oops, I can't hold this and this and do the clicker at the same time. <laughs> I was going to start this presentation by telling you that we have not done that many in-person presentations in the last couple of years, as you can imagine. And also, we just edited our um, presentation, so you're sort of guinea pigs, so bear with us. And we hope that we're answering more questions. We've gotten a lot of questions from folks, and so we adjusted it accordingly. Let's see. The clicker doesn't work. <laughs> I'm Nikki Ross, I'm the Executive Director, and we thought we would start um, by telling you our favorite food rescue story. So, um, I've been with Table to Table for five years. About eight weeks um, into my term as Executive Director, I got a phone call in the afternoon, I was the only one left in the office, and it was from a truck driver. And he said, I have a bunch of oranges that the grocery store refused to take. Do you guys want them? And I knew we did this, you know, occasionally. So I was like, yes, we definitely do. So I called up a volunteer and we went and met them at a Walmart parking lot <clears throat> to take these oranges off the truck. We opened up the back of the truck and there are two pallets, 800 pounds <laughs> weight of Brussels sprouts. Oh <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I thought, we are in the world, we're gonna take all these Brussels sprouts, but I'm really happy to report that by the end of the next day, every single bit of them were all distributed, so they're more popular than you think. <laughs> Hi, um, I am Lena Bartles. As you can see, I'm our Communications and Development Coordinator. Um, I've been with Table to Table for about two years, a little over two years now. Um, so I started in the September before the pandemic began, so it's it's felt interesting and like it doesn't feel like a normal two years <laughs> it's either 10 years or two months i can't tell um but uh, one of my favorite food rescue stories actually happened this past summer um and it's kind of a heartwarming story and we don't since we're not a direct service organization uh, we're not directly working with um, people in the community a lot um, that we're serving um we don't often hear from them uh, but we got the kindest Facebook message from uh, a person who had visited one of our pop-up produce stands the day before. And she had collected a whole ton of tomatoes. Like we had lots of tomatoes that we had harvested by that point. And so she cleaned up and she sent us a message that she had used those tomatoes, like she chopped it up, frozen chunks. Um, she's going to make a whole bunch of salsa and tomato soups and tomato sauce, spaghetti sauce for all of her, like, I think she said like 18 neighbors, people that she cooks food for. Um, so that, those tomatoes were not just serving her and her family, but a whole community or all of her neighbors. Um, and then I actually, uh, I was working at a produce pop-up um, a few, oh, it was like a few weeks after we got that message, and I ran into her um, in person. And it was so funny, because she was telling me all about the tomatoes she had gotten at the last um, produce pop-up. and. I was like, that's awesome. Like, I remember you. You Facebook messaged us. <laughs> so that was kind of a really cool connection that we had that day. All right, so leading into our presentation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is food rescue and what do we end up doing with all of this food that we rescue. So uh, we like to, oh no, <laughs> did anyone see it? Uh, would anyone like to toss out a guess um, how much of the food that America produces gets wasted every year? <laughs> Good eyes. <laughs> yes, 40%. Um, and 10% of the food that is grown here in America never makes it out of the farm field. 37% um, of the food is wasted after you buy it at the store. Um, people are tossing it in their own households. 
Um, and not only is food being wasted, um, but all of the resources that went into making and preparing, growing that food. Um, so all of the water that takes gallons and tons of water um, to produce all of this food, as you know, um, fuel costs of transporting it, the labor and the time that went into making and preparing it. Um, so it's wasting um, a lot of our resources. Um, so Table of Table is dealing with food waste on three different fronts. Um, we're preventing greenhouse gas emissions from organic waste in the landfill. When food sits in the landfill, um, it produces methane. Um, and I believe I read a statistic, I think every 100 pounds of food produces about 8.3 pounds of methane that is then released into the atmosphere. Um, and we are also reclaiming all of those resources that were expended to grow and produce that food um, in the food cycle. And we're feeding people um, with all of that food that could have gone to waste. Um, so, uh, for table to table, um, this past year, 2.2 million pounds of food were donated by um, local businesses, um, farms, farmers, gardeners, farmers markets, um, and over 1 million pounds, so a little over half of all of that food that was donated was produce, meat, or dairy products, which is really important um, because those are some of the tougher things to find. They're more expensive in the stores. They're more expensive for pantries to purchase. So when we can collect and rescue those foods and donate them for free to pantries, um, it's much more cost effective for them. Is that in the Iowa City area alone? Johnson County. Johnson. Yeah, Johnson County wide. Yep. That's yeah. a lot for our neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. All of that could be 2.2 million pounds of food that would have gone into the Iowa City landfill, and it's perfectly edible, good food. Um, and that equals out to about 2 million meals for our neighbors who are in need. Um, so this kind of goes into a little bit of our um, climate impact. Um, so we are, like I mentioned, we're working to mitigate that methane that's being released into the atmosphere. Um, so we're happy to report, um, based off a study that students from the university did for us a couple of years ago, um, the equivalent uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we saved by our food rescue efforts after accounting for our operational emissions, so driving the trucks, um, it's equivalent to uh, 17,400 pounds of coal that would have been burned, or 2 million smartphones charged, <laughs> that's kind of a fun one, or 39,000 miles driven by an average passenger vehicle. Um, and that's saving, um, I calculated it out, it's saving 182,600 pounds of methane from being released into the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a big impact on the earth as well as our neighbors. Um, so just talking a little bit about route-based food rescue, that's what Table to Table does, that's our model. It's been our model since 1996 when we were founded. Um, route-based food rescue means that we're following what this chart says. So um, a store partners with Table to Table and we have a, I think over, well it's over a hundred donor partners by now, not all of those are stores, that's counting all of the gardeners, farmers that we work with, but we're working with multiple stores in this area, um, and they are the ones setting aside wholesome food that they can no longer sell, but they're setting it aside specifically for table to table, and they know when we're gonna come pick it up. Um, so, this is where our volunteers come in. Uh, route volunteers uh, travel to these stores. Um, they have kind of a schedule that they follow, they travel to these stores, um, pack up all the donations that were set aside and load them up into the van, um, and then they drive it directly to um, all of the, there's a list, they have um, like pantries on their list, youth programs, um, shelters, meal sites, uh, whatever's on their schedule, they're gonna drive to those locations and drop off the food donations. And um, what's kind of unique is that 
uh, the partners working at those um, recipient sites can kind of look through the van, decide what food they need that day. So for example, um, Mary, <laughs> Mary Palmberg, one of our volunteers, she might stop at um, the Hate Cap daycare program. And Jen, uh, who works there, will come out to the van and say, okay, you got chopped fruit. That's great, we'd like some chopped fruit, uh, milk, that'll be great for lunch today. And she can go through and pick out what she's gonna need that day. And that helps prevent that food from being wasted. And that just helps her get exactly what she needs. Um, and so, uh, how this compares to other food rescue models um, one different food rescue model from what we do is the warehouse model. Um, so this is kind of like when you picture a food bank. Um, they've got like a big warehouse that they can store food in. Um, so they all like have a hired driver, a staff driver, drive to a location to pick up food. Um, they'll just roll up to the dock, like the back doors. Um, the food will be loaded into their vehicle. They don't really know what's in there, they don't see it, um, and then they drive um, to the warehouse and store the donations there. Um, and then they might sit there for a day or two, they might sit for a bit because they've got the warehouse to store it in, um, and they're working to match it with a place that needs it, but um, it just may sit for a while, and uh, the food like may go bad or it may just be a little less fresh, not getting to our neighbors as soon as it could be. Um, another model is the one-to-one -one model. So this is where you take out the table to table in this map. And so it may be that Coralville Pantry uh, goes to Target on Tuesdays and Thursdays to pick up food donations and they do it directly. But then maybe Community Food Bank is going to Target on Wednesday and Fridays and it's um, you're cutting out the middleman Maybe they aren't able to send a van that day. Maybe they don't have someone to go get it. Um, maybe the pantry gets way more milk than they can store anywhere that they can hold on to. Um, and so that can create waste. Um, so a table of tables model, we're really working to reduce waste um, by having multiple stops, having multiple recipient partners that we can connect the food to, um, let, giving them choice of what they want so then they know what they can store, they know what they need, they know what they'll use, so they're less likely to throw food donations out. Um, so really we're trying to do the most efficient food rescue model possible. earlier, but um, we do capture food um, from a variety of stages in the food life cycle, if you will. Um, so we're capturing it at food production. Um, farms and gardeners are now donating more than 100,000 pounds of produce and eggs, which is fresh stuff. It's wonderful. Um, distribution. This is a really fun one um, with the semi-truck here. So uh, this is where we get the calls from the semi-truck drivers that may have a rejected load. And we'll find out why it was rejected and if it's food safe then, um, and we can find a home for it, then we'll take it. Um, so, uh, and also drivers of our 22 foot truck that we have, um, they recover 15,000 pounds of food every week from food warehouses. Um, so those are large loads. Um, and connecting back to Nikki's Brussels sprout story. Um, this is where the cutting into the semi-deliveries that need rescued comes in. Uh, processing, so we work with two creameries. Um, we work in Kelowna um, that donate 250 gallons of milk each week. And we also get tofu and hummus and spaghetti sauce from local processors. Um, purchasing, this is where the retail markets and stores come in and retail grocery stores account for 50% of the food that we rescue. Um, and then prepared food. Um, so that's the hospitality sector that's picking up food from dorms, hotels, restaurants, and they donate, donate enough food for 60,000 prepared meals each year. What about like refrigeration? 
Do you mean our refrigeration on site? Yeah, I mean, all that food can't be, you know, fresh. I mean, the question. Yeah, so the question is, what about refrigeration yeah. on our end? Like, yeah. do we have refrigeration? How do we handle yeah. that? Yeah. First of all, six of our eight vehicles are refrigerated. So when they're, it's being transported, we keep it cold. That's okay. really important. Okay. But I really, you know, we just heard about this model of we, we pick it up and we drop it off the same day. Like, okay. honestly, if we bring food back, we sort of think it's a failure. <laughs> we didn't do a good job. Mary didn't sell everything off her truck that day. <laughs> that never happens to her. <laughs> um, but we actually have, believe it or not, we do this entire operation, two and a half million pounds of food a year, with six household refrigerators. That's what we have in our warehouse. So if something comes back, we can store it. And one deep freezer. <laughs> yes, a deep freezer. <clears throat> um, so, this is where all the food comes from and, and amounts and that sort of thing. Um, where does it go? Uh, this is uh, particularly exciting to me because Table to Table could not exist without our partnerships. Anne said earlier, when she said we don't do direct service, what she means is we don't distribute food to the public directly. That is in our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is literally be in the wheels. <laughs> you know, we don't, um, we have partners who know their neighborhoods, they know their, um, their clients and their food pantry members and the youth they serve. They know them better than we will ever know them in terms of deciding what they need for their program. So it's much better if we partner with organizations. Um, and we do that a lot and with a wide variety. So first and foremost, food pantries. They get the largest variety of the food, of the food we distribute to the most people. Um, this last six months, our food pantry partners served 16,000 people in the last six months. Pantry partners get 60% of all the food they distribute to people comes from table to table. So if you think about that, if we did not recover food in our community, the people who need this food would have 60% less food available to them when they go to shop at their pantry. It's really important. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Um, so other partners we partner with, um, mental health um, mental health programs, they're like group, they do group therapy and things like that, um, nonprofits. They'll get snacks from us. Um, and what's great about that is they've described having snacks or like Friday we get pizzas from the schools um, and so Friday afternoon um, group sessions are super popular. <laughs> and you, you guys know, if you have food, it's always more popular. <laughs> um, so, you know, that just, it's not just feeding people from a nutrition standpoint, but also building community. Um, the Head Start programs, Anne gave that example of on Mary's route. Um, we take food to preschools. What I love about the Head Start programs is they're introducing kids to new foods. Oh, we get all kinds. Brussels sprouts, I told you, <laughs> jicama, like all kinds of stuff, maybe strange to people, but they're trying to introduce new foods. They had a whole lesson one time where they counted peas. Like they learned, you know, de-shelled the peas and then they counted them. I just think that's so great. Um, and she also will take extra food on Fridays to send home with the families and sometimes send them with a recipe. So they like made a veggie soup once and she had all the ingredients that they used that day to make their veggie soup sent it home with their parents with the recipe so they could make it at home. Um, the domestic violence shelter, this was like several years ago. We had been only donating to them like when they asked um, and we arranged to make a regular delivery to the, to the program um, because everybody who lives in shelter needs to eat, right? They have to provide for those basic needs. And when we started that regular partnership, they saved enough money on food purchasing to hire a staff person to help them with their programming. So, you know, just that cost savings alone is, is a huge contributor to partners. Um, so all of the hot meal sites, the Salvation Army serves a dinner. They send people home with like a sack breakfast, the free lunch program serves a lunch six days a week. Um, and so, What's special about these partners is they'll take all kinds of food we have, first of all, but specifically those hospitality foods. So we might get um, six pans of chicken parmesan from Catlett Dorm, like that they didn't 
it's never, it's not been put out to serve. It's just, they cooked it up, it's really nice. I don't know, we had a brisket once that it was already cooked and, you know, so we take it to those um, meal sites. They don't have to prepare anything for their main entree, you know, they can do the veggies and everything else. It just really helps things go a long way. Um, and then another thing we don't often think about, we, we recover food from gas stations and convenience stores, which I don't know if you've been into a uh, come and go like fresh market lately, chopped um, produce and veggies and hummus and salads, um, sandwiches, all of that stuff is meant to be taken to go. And when we started those partnerships, we thought, oh man, we stop here and it's like a couple boxes, you know, like how impactful is this really that people want it? It is like one of our most popular items because especially for organizations serving people who are unhoused, for example, they don't have any place to cook a meal. Like, and so if they can just send them with a sandwich and a salad or whatever, that just makes it a lot easier um, for them to get. And also, you know, you wouldn't think of gas station food as being nutritious, but there are nutritious options available. And we get a lot of them because most people don't go to a gas station to buy nutritious food. <laughs> so we end up with it. Um, so we started our presentation with a slide that said, Wasted food is a wasted opportunity. <clears throat> and after explaining where all this food goes and how it can be used, we hope you can see that. Um, this food we reclaim is an opportunity to provide basic, basic needs for those seeking safety um, or comfort um, when they're, for people who are maybe in the worst situation they've ever been in in their lives. Um, it's an opportunity to provide stability and companionship to someone experiencing a mental health crisis. It's an opportunity to expand kids' food repertoire and potentially impact their good choices and overall health for the rest of their lives. That's a big deal. Um, and we can do that by striving to do just this, this one thing, this one pretty simple thing. Um, we take this food that could be a wasted opportunity and we reclaim its potential. Here, I mentioned earlier the thousands of people that are served. I have a little asterisk here. Uh, COVID, I just, we don't know. <laughs> the number of people who were, who were facing food insecurity in Johnson County, and truly, we basically serve every single one of them because we have so many partners. We're reaching people everywhere. Um, but just because of, of the disruption that we've experienced, there's just no way to know how many it is. It was 19,000 three years ago. It has to be at least this high now. We know that from some basic numbers. But the other thing about this is, during COVID, one thing we learned as a hunger relief network is that the fewer barriers that you can put in front of folks to access food, the more people you're going to help. That seems it's pretty simple. Um, so when we do our produce pop-ups, people don't sign up, they don't leave their name, they don't tell us how many people are in their family, we don't restrict how much food they take. It's not necessary. This is all food that was going to go to waste. Like, we don't need to ask any questions. We're, in, we're very um, privileged in that way because <clears throat> organizations that have to buy their food or report their numbers and things, they have to ask those questions. And we're able to partner with folks who maybe don't. Um, and so that's what brings our number higher, too, is, you know, we just don't know, always. <laughs> yeah, I have a quiet voice, so I need the mic. <laughs> um, so, with what resources do we rescue almost two and a half million pounds of food? Um, well, we have six staff managing operations, uh, five full-time, two part, one part-time, um, eight vehicles for food delivery. So like Nikki mentioned, six of them are refrigerated. One of them is a 22 foot straight truck. <laughs> um, and the rest are like uh, kind of cargo van size. We have two small minivans too. So a variety of vehicles in our fleet. Um, we have over 150 partners, both donating and receiving food. Um, so that's all of the food donors, the stores, the farmers, the markets, the convenience stores. Um, and all of the recipient partners, so the pantry, shelters, youth programs, 
uh, mental health programs. And we have over 100 volunteers coming in our doors every week <laughs> to uh, help us carry out rescuing food, um, supporting our operations in multiple ways, um, which I'll get into on the next slide here. Well, we had a lovely slide of photos <laughs> of our volunteers. Oh, um, lost. Sorry. <laughs> you'll just have to imagine. <laughs> um, but volunteers are really the heart of Table to Table and the food rescue mission that we carry out. Um, so volunteer service, we have over 400 volunteers every year um, supporting our mission and their service is equivalent to nine full-time staff members. Uh, many food banks have to hire and pay drivers to do what our volunteers do for free at Table to Table. Um, so we're always so grateful for them. Um, more than half of our volunteers are retirees, um, and the rest are students. Uh, so we have a lot of college students working with us, and a few high school students too, um, and other residents of our community. Sometimes we'll have a family come in and volunteer together, and we have lots of couples that volunteer together, so it's, it can be a family affair. Um, and what do our volunteers do? Well, um, like I said earlier, they are driving around the stores and picking up donations and then delivering it to uh, pantries and other recipient partners. Um, but we have a lot of other needs that go into supporting food rescue as well. Um, and so we have um, reception volunteers who are sitting at our front desk helping answer the phones, greeting people as they come in and helping with some basic services there. Um, we have people doing data entry. So uh, if you're rescuing two and a half million pounds of food every year and <laughs> distributing it to over 50 different partners, um, you have a lot of data um, and we have to keep track of all of that. Um, so we have volunteers who are really good at like Excel spreadsheets and figuring out data and they help us um, record all of that data and then organize it and report it. Um, we have um, volunteers on core support. So these are volunteers, they're flexible, they're there and they do whatever is needed that day. If we need a quick sub for a route last minute, they can go do that. Um, if we need them to get our vans prepped, um, they can do that in the morning. Um, if we need them to just ferry a quick uh, donation over to a pantry, they can do that. It's just um, anything that comes up and we need support for, they help. Um, we have volunteers in our shop. Um, so with our fleet of vehicles, they have to be kept up. And uh, we transport all of our food in banana boxes. So we are very familiar with banana boxes at table to table. And we have all of the vans in the morning preloaded and ready with empty banana boxes, according to the quantity of food we expect on its next route. Um, and we have volunteers in the shop the day before packing all those empty boxes, getting them into the van, getting the correct number into the van. So then when route volunteers come in for their route in the morning, they can just hop in and sail away. They're ready to go. Um, so it just really helps streamline our process and make it efficient as possible. And then we also have um, committee members. Um, so we have several different committees, volunteer engagement committee, uh, resource development, fundraising, um, event committee, program operations committee, a finance committee, lots of committees that volunteers, wherever they have their talents or their passions, they can lend a hand there and uh, give us advice and help us look over um, plans and drafts of things and discuss and ask questions and really just help us put out the best work possible. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I like this graphic a lot. Anne came up with this um, this year for um, our FY21 financials. What I love about this is this whole bar all the way across here, all the way to the end, represents the value of all the food that we recover. So when you look at these boxes down here, this shows what it costs us to recover all of that value. And then this, um, and so that's, you know, just under $400,000 a year to do all of that. It's pretty remarkable. And this um, graphic 
or the, the rectangle here on the right, represents um, where our income comes from. So about half is people who literally write us a check. Um, last year, we had several unsolicited grants. <laughs> um, either like the government was supporting operations for emergencies, um, or there were foundations who gave us money. So a lot of our contributions from last year, um, as you can see, we, we raised more money last year than we spent. Um, and it has allowed us to actually put into practice um, to implement some things we really needed. So first of all, we had to relocate recently. Um, we have a big construction project, it's about half done. And then the one I'm really excited about what, we're, what we've done with some of this money is use it as a match for our software implementation. So Anne talked about tracking two and a half million pounds of food in Excel spreadsheets and on paper. And that just, it's just not a good, <laughs> like good way to do that. It's really hard to get data out. We really want to be able to tell in real time, like did the HACAP Head Start um, get a low delivery today because the food was less? So should we think about taking them extra food tomorrow? That, that kind of thing. So our new software system will allow us to do that in more real time. Um, and it's about like $130,000 project. Um, but if you think about the impact it could potentially have on our operation, it's, it's significant. <clears throat> oh, this one's mine. <laughs> um, we did a lot of new things this year. So route-based food rescue, that's the bread and butter. We've been doing that for 25 years now. Um, this year, obviously, the need in our community was just tremendous. And we heard, we hosted um, hunger relief network meetings with everybody in Johnson County who were trying to serve people during the crisis. And we heard so many different things. Um, we helped last year with a, um, restaurants would make meals and we would pick them up and take them to the free lunch program. That was like an extra thing that we did. Uh, but, but essentially, this last year, what we've, what we've sort of our policy is say yes to every opportunity for food because we know people need it. Um, and so Anne's gonna talk a little bit about some of those things. When I get over the mic. <laughs> um, so uh, one of those main initiatives was local produce recovery. How can we really amp that up and um, get a lot of this local produce that uh, farmers may have access of and get it connected to people who need access to it. Um, so this past year, we harvested, like this, just like just this summer, we harvested over 50,000 pounds of fruits and veggies. Um, so that's, I should say, that's from harvesting it at local farm fields and also from community gardeners or just home gardeners, anybody who has a garden and has extra, um, dropping off their food donations to us, if, you know you plant tomatoes and you get about six times as much as you wanted. <laughs> and so uh, people bring in their extra boxes of tomatoes, zucchini, squash, um, and then volunteers went out to glean um, excess food in local farmers' fields. Um, so they were going out in groups to harvest that food. Um, as you can see, people of all ages enjoy it. <laughs> um, but that's also recovery from local farmers' markets. So we've worked with the Iowa City's Farmers Market for uh, several years now. I actually don't know exactly how many, um, but we really made an effort this year to stop, check in with every farmer there and see um, who had extra to donate. And maybe we got produce, maybe we got some other kinds of goods, sometimes like some baked goods. Um, so it was all uh, good local donations. Um, And uh, one way um, that we got this local produce out to people was through produce pop-ups. And this is supposed to be a video, and I don't know if it's going to play. <laughs>
I'll just talk. Um, <laughs> so we distributed 20% of the produce that we collected this summer through produce pop-ups. So that kind of connects back to my story I told earlier um, with Paula, who messaged us on Facebook. She had attended a produce pop-up and gotten lots of tomatoes. Um, so that's where we would set up a table um, in a neighborhood or at a pantry or a community center or an event. Um, and they, uh, that was then manned by table-to-table uh, -table volunteers and people could walk up and see what we had and take whatever they needed. Um, and often people would take it for their neighbors or they'd say, oh, so-and-so is at home today. Um, they can't get out, but I'm gonna take some extra for them and deliver it to them. Um, so this was really a great way um, to get produce out. Um, people can only access pantries a limited number of times um, per week or per month. Um, so then these pop-ups are kind of like a neighborhood farmer's market um, for people to get their veggies for the week, even if they've already been to the food pantry that week or they couldn't make it. Um, and an important thing to note is that uh, as we mentioned earlier, we are not a direct service organization, so we do all of these pop-ups in partnership um, with other nonprofits. Um, so like we may work with the Coralville Pantry, set up a table in their parking lot, and uh, people can stop by and get produce after they stopped in the pantry that day. Um, or the neighborhood centers put on a, like a back to school event um, that lots of kids were at, and we had a produce stand there um, and so people could do the back to school activities with their kids and then they could see, oh, there's like free fresh produce over there. So they could go over and grab some produce and take that home as well. So it was a really good accessible way um, for people to access fresh produce with um, trying to minimize barriers to that produce as much as we could, um, having it in their neighborhood so travel wasn't an issue um, having it free um, and available and not having to have to ask any questions. Like Nikki mentioned earlier, we didn't have to um, ask any questions um, for them to receive the food. If I could just visualize for you what this video was, it was really cool. So we were at the neighborhood center of Johnson County and we had a produce pop up and it was like right around when the school bus let out. So off the bus comes all these kids um, like beeline straight to the produce pop-up. It was really shocking. And so this video is all these kids just like huddled around the produce and they have bags and they're like filling their bags full of produce. I mean, I've never seen, seen anything like it. Um, so maybe I'll, we'll be able to show that to you next time, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so some other things we did, um, food box distributions. You may have heard that the USDA did farm to family food boxes. The interesting thing about that is they were they were a box with some dairy, some produce, some cooked meat in it, um, and it was sort of meant to make that connection for folks who were struggling and maybe didn't have other resources. Now, they came in a giant truck. If your community wanted to you to access these food boxes, you had to agree to get a 26 or 50 26 pallets, 26 pallets of boxes of these food and it had to be refrigerated like it what we found it had already been happening for a couple of months when we discovered that none of our partners had signed up because who can accept that much so we worked out to to say yes i said we tried really hard to say yes we have a 22 foot refrigerated truck so in conjunction with johnson county emergency management um, we accepted three different loads um, three different times and um, distributed these boxes just straight out of the back of the truck. We sent to our partners what they could take, um, and we did that three times. And so, you know, this is just where if the food was accessible, you know, that's not food rescue. <laughs> um, you know, we had some conversation I'm like that's a little bit out of your mission. But the way I see it, I, I saw on the news that um, the food boxes they didn't have the end distribution figured out, right? They didn't know how partners were going to actually get it to people. They, they paid for all this food to be packed up, but didn't have a plan. So in the cities, they were dropping pallets of these boxes on city corners, like in the middle of the summer. 
it's not food safe. Like, we, I just couldn't, we were just saying, you know, our community had to say no, and we, we wanted to say yes, and it was really valuable. Um, so we did that. It was over 100,000 meals we were able to access. And then, you know, we just looked at other national partnerships. We were contacted by a vegan food aid. Um, so they're essentially like a vegan outreach organization trying to teach people about um, how to eat a in a vegan lifestyle. Um, but they wanted to help during the crisis. So they purchased a very large truck full of produce um, and they trucked it from California to Iowa. We said, yes, we'll receive it. And then over the course of a week and a half by storing it in our big truck and by setting up pop-ups and all of the things that we were doing to distribute, we were able to get out 40,000 pounds of produce. And that was before our like gleaning operation started, so early summer, when other types of produce weren't readily available. We hope to continue this. Um, we think they're gonna wanna do that again. What we want them to do is to give it to us in February <laughs> when there is no fresh produce. <laughs> so we're hoping to, to be able to do that again. Um, here's our volunteer pictures <laughs> of all the things we were, we were doing um, in these last couple of years. And I just have one more slide. So what we do is we redistribute abundance. Um, we think about, we get the question a lot, like why are you called table to table? <laughs> because you don't take food from one person's table and put it on another. Um, I read this children's book recently, it's called The Greatest Table. Have any of you read it? It's a poem. It talks about how we produce enough food in this world to feed everybody. And that if we saw our world as a collective table, that everybody would have enough to eat. And I, it just really resonated with me because we produce enough food to feed two billion more people in this world than actually are alive today. So why does anyone have to face food insecurity or hunger? Alone, um, we can't change the global inequities that leave empty plates and undernourished bodies, but we can do our part every day to redistribute the abundance we have right here in our own community. And this picture, you can't see it because it's really white. Um, we got this picture today. Uh, this was from the, this little girl is eating an entire lunch made from food off the table to table truck just today. And I just love that so much. Look at it, look at the green vegetables. And the fruit, sorry, milk. <laughs> so, yeah. What questions can I answer for you? Okay, I have a farm. I lived on the farm, and I'm thinking of the times I threw out food, muffs, melons. I don't know, probably 50 of them. We had so many. I had no idea where to go. All the neighbors were full, and I didn't have time to deliver because I'm working. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. You need to get to these people somehow. Uh, the advertising has got to change. That is exactly what we launched last summer. So yeah. we knew, like making connections with farmers was the hardest thing, and it's why three years ago our gleaning, and gleaning program, which is when we go to farms and harvest food, 3,000 pounds. This year, that program alone recovered like 12,000 pounds. It's all about, she wanted to know, you know, she had a farm and they would just have to throw away melons, like things they couldn't get rid of. You can't, you don't have a way to distribute it. Farmers also already deal with transportation issues. We will come pick it up. So one of the things we're gonna, um, we did this year was postcards. Any farmer, we could, like uh, practical farmers of Iowa have an index of farmers that are in our area. So we sent everybody a postcard. We sent everybody an email. Um, we haven't tapped that resource entirely yet, so there's more to do. Um, another thing that would help is um, I get the Iowa Farmer Magazine. It's probably my favorite. Successful Farmer Farm Journal, all of them. If that, somehow you could advertise in these, of course that's expensive. <laughs> and, but this magazine goes everywhere in Iowa. If we just get an ad in that magazine, that's a good idea. Help. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Also, we helped launch the Iowa Gleaning Network, which set up gleaning operations around the whole state. Now, we don't run those, um, but we knew 
other places were having the same problems we were, connecting to farmers, having the resources, connecting. Like, the Iowa Gleaning Network could put an ad into any one of those publications you described, and, and they would be able to connect to one of seven operations happening all around the state um, to do the lead. There's got to be a better way. Yeah, what can I answer for you? Can you give us a little history how this started in Johnson County? Oh, I left the history out. <laughs> um, so the story is that Frank Lawler, he was one of our founders, and there were 10 other people. He would never want me to say that he was a founder of Table Table because it took a village. Um, he was on lunch one day, and he was watching C-SPAN, and Second Harvest was like a relatively new food rescue kind of idea, and, and they were speaking at the small business committee um, for the house, and they were saying, hey, we know a lot of businesses have extra food, like we should recover it and give it to people, and Frank saw that, and he thought, well, why aren't we doing that in Iowa City? And so he connected with folks from Mercy and New Pioneer and I'm never gonna name them all off the top of my head, so my apologies. <laughs> and this was in 1996, and within a year of those first conversations, we had a telephone in an office in Old Brick <laughs> with an answering machine. And Frank would go over there every single day to hear if any donor, any grocery store called and said, we have a donation for you to pick up. Um, and that first year, six volunteers recovered 50,000 pounds of food. And that's when I think everybody realized <laughs> this was an idea that was really gonna happen. And was we, we are one of the longest established food rescues in the country. Um, we are one of less than 30 who do a route-based food rescue model. It's hard work. It takes a lot of coordination. You have to have the vehicles and the resources, and most importantly, a community who believes in the work you're doing and is willing to support it. Um, I don't believe that they could do route-based food rescue in Linn County because they don't have the volunteer base we do. Um, I mean, honestly, we like Ann said, we'd have to pay nine people to do the work that we do um, on top of our staff. Yeah? How can you assure that you don't get spoiled food, et cetera, et cetera. We have a whole, oh yeah, how can we ensure that we don't get spoiled food? Part of the reason why we send volunteers to pack food into boxes and we don't just accept it being put directly into our trucks without looking at it is that process of checking to make, checking those dates. We have clipboards and on the back of every one of them it says, um, you know, food is still good, this much past the date, you know, X, Y, Z. But you'd be surprised that less than 50% of what we collect is actually short dated. The food we get from the food warehouse hasn't even made its way to a grocery store yet. So we got like, one time we got 8,000 pounds of yogurt that still had three months on it. Like, you know, when we talk about food recovery, we're not talking about ugly fruit. That's some of it, but that's not the majority. If you're going around and giving these demonstrations, wouldn't it be a great idea, maybe it'd be too expensive, give everybody here a handout of your address. And and we could we could take them ourselves and run them off and give them to our friends. Yes, you could. <laughs> well, I did bring handouts, and our address is on it. <laughs> One thing we say when we hand out our brochure is, when you're done reading this, give it to somebody else. But you're right, it's that word of mouth and people who know. I know Mary has told everybody she can <laughs> about recovering food and brings everybody. And another thing, um, I'm reading in the Iowa Farmer and these magazines where men, or the dairies, are throwing their milk out on the ground. Mm -hmm. You've been hearing this? We collect it. <laughs> they don't throw it away if we know about it. So there's a dairy that comes all the way here from Hudson to bring us their excess dairy, and then we drive to Kelowna to the Supernatural Creamery to get it, because you're right. It's, it's one of the hardest things to rescue because it is short dated. You have to have a plan for where it's gonna go. <clears throat> Did you have a question? No, my, my brain's going around here with refrigeration and, and the spoiled part of it, because mm -hmm. don't all the stores have warehouses where they store the food and don't they have a problem with refrigeration? You'd be surprised.
surprised at how tight an operation a grocery store is. They don't really store a lot of perishable food because that's just lost to them. Okay. So, um, no, I don't think that's, you know, but every, every store is different in how, I hate to use the word, but how committed they are to making sure the food gets recovered as opposed to just goes in the trash. It costs the money to throw it out and they get a tax break if they donate it but it takes staff time to pull it off the shelves and to deal with it. So um, one of our partners that I always like to highlight is Trader Joe's. Um, they're national, like in their staff training, it's we donate food, we don't throw any food out. <laughs> and it is part of like their national program. They are so committed to it. I've, tr I've gotten, one of our board members is their general manager and I get the paperwork they use to train their staff because I want to give it to everybody else. They do such a good job. 76% of what they donate to us is produce, meat, and dairy. It's just amazing. Um, so we're just working with folks and trying to increase that commitment and, and help them. The farmer that farms my farm, for instance, he'll have, they have sweet corn. Every year, they'll come and deliver to their own, the people that uh, own the land they'll bring their sweet corn to them and they still, they're throwing out sweet corn and they, they're right here in Iowa City. They don't know about this program. This is the problem, is getting it, the word out. You have connections with farmers, it sounds like. Maybe we need yeah, to be connected. <laughs> yes, let's talk. <laughs> so that's the other thing. We will go gleaning our gleaning program while food rescue happens here in Johnson County. We actually, Mechanicsville, we went to Mechanicsville to harvest. One of the challenges for farmers is actually the labor to harvest what's left over. You know, it's just cheaper for them to leave it in the field. Yeah. Um, and so we will go and harvest it, you know. And that's that's the key. That's We, we tout it as a service. <laughs> year after year, we had sweet corn that just went in the field and nobody got it. And I, I wouldn't doubt that's maybe every farm. I bet. Every farm. Because they just don't know about it. Hmm. Other questions? Okay, there was an organization when my daughter was in college here at Iowa that they picked up food. But this would have been in the 80s. So you weren't going then, right? No, but, but pre operations like table to table, that one-to-one -one food rescue has been happening on a very small scale. So a pantry would probably go to Heidi. Solon is a great example. They have a grocery store in Solon. The food pantry in Solon gets food directly from that grocery store. We don't pick that up because they're right there. Um, so that, that's always been happening. I think what we do is like thinking about the bigger picture and connecting so many different sources of food to so many different partners that just really keeps it from going to waste. We did a food waste audit this year. Table to table itself um, threw away less than 2,000 pounds of food out of two and a half million. Now, our partners do throw food away. Bread, I'll tell you, they're throwing away bread every single day. But that's because bread is so cheap to make. Organizations overproduce that like insane. And so we take what we can, people eat what they can eat, and then they do have to throw that out. And we're looking at ways to mitigate waste at that end too. But, um, but we know we're, we're getting pretty much every pound <laughs> that we can. I always tell people, we doubled the amount of food we rescued since 2016, doubled, because there were so many sources. But I tell people, that's not gonna happen again in the next three years. We found a lot of it. <laughs> And so what we want to work on is increasing the produce, meat, and dairy, because that's really what's needed, and that's what our partners need. So even in small amounts, we're going to find that and, and recover it. But what did you do about the COVID? Say that again? What did you do about COVID? Oh, well, we lost 80. Oh, what, what did we do about COVID? I'm sorry. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> what did we do about COVID? Uh, well, we lost 80% of our volunteers in the first six months of the pandemic. Um, that was our choice to help protect folks and because we didn't have a lot of information. Um, so the staff did it. We reduced, essentially what we did is, we used to say, we don't want a food rescue route to last longer than two hours because we'll lose volunteers. <laughs> they can commit to two hours. It's hard work, you know, loading all that. 
Um, we were very fortunate that the folks who we added new volunteers, we made the routes longer, essentially. We added more donors and more partners to every single route in order to continue to rescue the food. And we didn't lose food during the pandemic. Our, our loss of volunteers was hard on us, <laughs> um, but we did manage. And now we're back up to full capacity even more because um, some of those folks who raised a hand during the pandemic have stayed on, and that's been incredible. I just really appreciate that you all had us here this evening, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, I left a flyer there. Um, it's a day in the life of food rescue at Table to Table, which I think is really interesting. So definitely check one of those out. If I didn't, I didn't print enough, I'm looking at you, and I know I didn't. Um, but maybe I can send a digital copy and it can be forwarded to you all. <laughs>